Good evening, my name is Ann Malmogordon. I am the Education Director of the Alabama Holocaust Education Center. The AHC, AHEC is an educational nonprofit institution. It is dedicated to teaching about the Holocaust and honoring the survivors who made their homes in Alabama. We recently moved into a new physical space on Highland Avenue and hope to welcome you there soon. Tonight, we are excited to be gathering for our third annual Crystal Knock Commemorative Lecture, a collaborative program between the Alabama Holocaust Education Center and the UAB College of Arts and Sciences and the Department of History. This is actually the first time this series has been in person rather than on Zoom, so we are thrilled to have you all here with us tonight. This program will be recorded and will be posted next week on our YouTube channel for you to re-watch and or share with your friends. I want to thank Dr. Jonathan Wiesen, um, who is an AHEC board member as well as professor and chair of the Department of History at UAB for his collaboration on this meaningful project. I also want to take a moment to recognize the Holocaust survivors who are here with us tonight. My father, Dr. Robert May, and Jack Schnimmer. I want to thank our financial sponsors for tonight's program, the Rita C. Kimberly Public History Endowment at UAB and the Birmingham Jewish Foundation. Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass, was more than just mass destruction and the breaking of glass in Jewish synagogues, businesses, and homes on November 9th and 10th, 1938. The November pogrom, as this event is more aptly named, revealed the true depth and nature of popular anti-Semitism in Nazi Germany on the eve of the Holocaust. And it represented one of the most important turning points in national socialist anti-Semitic policy. Internationally, close to 1,000 different newspaper editorials were published about the events of Kristallnacht. Practically every American newspaper condemned Nazi Germany. Across Europe, that condemnation was close to universal. The world was not silent, and yet there was little meaningful action Immigration policies were not revised to accommodate fleeing Jews. In early 1939, during the notorious voyage of the St. Louis to the United States, desperate refugees were forced to return to Europe. British-controlled Palestine closed its doors in order to protect its Arab interests. Hitler himself revealed, revealed, reveled in the irony of the nations protesting the brutal pogrom while yet rejecting asylum for its victims. People always ask, what are the lessons of the Holocaust? Just in this one event, Kristallnacht, we see the evidence of speech without action. But there are many more. In commemoration of the events of Kristallnacht, the AHEC and the UAB College of Arts and Sciences hopes that these commemorative lectures will further our understanding of the events of the Holocaust and challenge us to learn from the lessons of the past so that we might be stewards for a better future. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jonathan Wiesen, who will introduce our featured guest. Yes. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, I really want to take a second to acknowledge all you've done and in this joint enterprise with UAB. It's been a pleasure since I've come here in 2019 to be able to work with such a dynamic and knowledgeable uh, compatriot. So I'm really grateful for that. And I'm grateful to the Alabama Holocaust Education Center, which has been a dynamic, dynamic um, part of my reality here in Birmingham, along with UAB. Welcome as well to the survivors. Welcome students. Welcome community members. I'm very happy to introduce my old friend and colleague, Wolf Gruner, Professor Gruner. As you can read some of this, uh, I'll give the uh, sort of boiled down version. Professor Gruner is uh, a historian at the University of Southern California. He's a professor of history. He's the Chappelle Guerin Chair in Jewish Studies, and he's also the founding director of the University of Southern California Dorn Sykes Center for Advanced Genocide Research at USC in Los Angeles. 
He received his PhD and his habilitation in history from the Technical University of Berlin in 1994 and 2006, respectively. He has also uh, been a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University, at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, and many other places. And he was also a visiting professor of global awareness at Webster University in St. Louis. Dr. Gruner is the uh, author of 10 books on the Holocaust. Uh, some titles you have listed there, Jewish Forced Labor Under the Nazis, Economic Needs and the Nazi Racial, Nazi racial Aims, came out with Cambridge in 2008. And a book that has, was published in Spanish that I've liberally translated as Pariahs of the Fatherland, you can tell me later if this is good, The Myth of the Liberation of the Indigenous People in the Republic of Bolivia, 1825 to 1890, that uh, came out in 2015. Uh, Professor Gruner's 2016 prize-winning book in Germany has been translated in 2019 as The Holocaust in Bohemia and Moravia, a Czech Initiatives, German Policies, and, Czech, and Jewish Responses. And it is coming out, or is already out perhaps, in Czech. Uh, if not, it's in Czech and in forthcoming in Hebrew. Uh, He's co-edited several books. Some of them include a book on, called New Perspectives on Kristallnacht after 80 years, the Nazi pogrom, pogrom in global comparison. And I will just, as an aside, mention that uh, Dr. Gruner has done some wonderful work on Kristallnacht that was very, very interesting to talk to him about a few years ago with him about because it just focuses not on only the shops that we think of this broken glass, but just the tremendous hardships people suffered when their apartments, their homes, as one of our survivors here knows personally, were ransacked. So this really deep dive into the details of that night and those days. He's also published, uh, co-edited a book on the Greater German Reich and the Jews, Nazi persecution policies in the annexed territories. His talk tonight will be uh, based on his forthcoming book with Yale called Impudent Jews, Forgotten Stories of Individual Jewish Resistance in Hitler's Germany. There's more you can read in the uh, booklet, but I am very delighted to welcome my colleague who I've seen in now Birmingham and uh, South Florida and in uh, various conferences here and there. So I'm really happy to welcome Professor Wolf Gruden. Thanks, uh, Jonathan. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, it's really a delight to be uh, here. And uh, thanks to Anne, both of you, uh, for this uh, kind invitation and uh, sponsored by the University uh, of Alabama, Birmingham, and the Holocaust Educational Center here. So it's a, a pleasure. And I also thank all of you for coming. It's in large numbers. It's, the room is all, uh, almost filled. And for me, um, to present this work here today is uh, kind of the conclusion of 14 years of work. Yeah, so 14 years I worked on this research. Um, and uh, it started in a, a local archive in Berlin where I came um, across a document in a police logbook uh, which struck me as very unusual. And at the time I had already worked on the Holocaust for 20 years. Uh, I had published several books on the Holocaust, but this act of protest in public by uh, a Jew in Berlin kind of hit me unexpected. And so I tried to uh, do more work on this, and 14 years later, I hope to publish the book next year. And the book is written in a different way than I wrote all of my other books. My other books are more academic, and uh, I, wanna, I wanted to write a book for a broader public, because I think what I want to uh, kind of convey has a much larger implication than uh, just a kind of one facet of the Holocaust here, and uh, because it is about Jewish resistance. And so uh, what I do in the book is I tell five stories of five Jewish resistors, men and women, uh, young and old, and uh, I show that these five people stand for certain types of resistance, and I will go more into this later in the talk. Um, in the talk, I first share one story, one of the five stories uh, from the book, and then I tell a little bit or talk a little bit about the significance of this 
a personal and individual story. And then I give you a brief overview, which is really hard, uh, uh, of the different kinds of uh, resistance act I found in the archives and in testimonies. So let me uh, lead you back in time uh, into the year 1940 uh, in Nazi Germany. When Hans Oppenheimer left his four-story apartment house, it was pitch black outside. Because of Allied air raids, not a single light illuminated the city of Frankfurt. It took a moment for his eyes to adjust to the darkness, and then slowly he moved away from his home. Hans Oppenheimer knew that he was not supposed to be outside at night because there was a curfew for Jews in place for almost a year. The 17-year-old boy was shivering for, from fear and cold. He anxiously waited for Allied bombers to approach Frankfurt to attack the city. When the sirens started to blare, and the first explosions could be heard, he rushed to the next fire alarm post and pulled the handle. The alarm bell rang, and this was what he had planned all along, diverting fire trucks from the actual bombing sites. How did he get there? Hans Oppenheimer was the first-born son of merchant Siegmund and his wife Martha. He had blue-gray eyes, a snubby nose, and reddish hair. He was 1.70 meters, I think that's like 5'6". Five, five, uh, so he was kind of not really tall, but slender. Uh, but at the time, people were not as tall as today, right? His father sold linings and other sewing accessories to tailors in Frankfurt. The family, the Jewish family, lived a good life in an apartment building on Wittelsbacher Allee, an imposing boulevard located in the city's northern district, Ostend. There, a lot of Jewish families lived. Soon after Martha Oppenheimer, gave birth to Hans in January 1923, she passed away. His father quickly remarried the new wife, the stepmom, Anna Fischer, was 20 years younger than his father. From age six onwards, Hans attended the Linné Elementary School right around the corner of his home. Then in 1933, after Hans had graduated from the elementary school, his parents enrolled him at one of the most famous Jewish schools in Germany, the Philanthropien in Frankfurt. The Rothschild, Rothschild family had founded the school in 1804, and despite the increasing persecution that affected any Jewish family in Frankfurt, the philanthropin was able to shield the uh, Jewish children from this kind of hostile environment, at least throughout the 1930s. After Hans graduated from middle school with good grades in 1937, he began an apprenticeship for two reasons. First, he wanted to learn a kind of a manual job as a support for his family in the short run. But then he also wanted to acquire skills which would enable him to leave Germany. That was the long-term plan. Because life had been unbearable for some years now in Frankfurt. Anti-Jewish laws and municipal policies made things miserable for Jewish families, for the lar second largest Jewish population in any given uh, city in Germany. Already in March 1933, the new Nazi mayor of Frankfurt had cut business ties to Jewish merchants and businesses and had immediately dismissed Jewish employees from the city government. As one of the first German cities 
to take such a measure, Frankfurt reduced welfare benefits for needy Jews uh, in 1936 already. The city also was one of the forerunners regarding arianization of real estate, private foundations, and art collections owned by Jews. That's the city government of Frankfurt. So not kind of the, the Nazi government. To prepare for a future abroad, Hans started an apprenticeship at the Jewish vocational school. It was established in an abandoned factory in 1936, and it was called the Jüdische Anlernwerkstatt. The uh, Anlernwerkstatt trained Jewish teenagers to become carpenters, locksmiths, gardeners. All of these valuable manual crafts improved their chances of immigration to Palestine or other countries, also including the United States. In spring of 1939, Hans finished the vocational school and registered at the Frankfurt Labor Office to, in order to find work. Soon after his registration, almost immediately, the Frankfurt Labor Office sent the 16-year-old Hans Oppenheimer to a newly established forced labor camp for Jews in Stein Neukirch, almost 70 miles uh, away from Frankfurt. The camp was part of a new, newly established early forced labor program introduced after Kristallnacht in order to exploit those Jews who, had, uh, who received unemployment benefits from the German state. Until summer 1939, this program amassed 20,000 Jewish men who performed forced labor, even before the war started. That's very kind of unknown still. They toiled in road construction, street cleaning, and garbage, garbage dumps. After Hans was dismissed from the first camp in fall 1939, he performed forced labor for the city uh, government of Frankfurt. In March 1940, the labor office put him on a train in, in, to another forced labor camp for Jews in Kelkheim Taunus. While the small town was located only 10 miles away from his hometown, Hans could not see his family for months. Jewish forced laborers didn't get vacations due to newly established anti-Jewish labor regulations. Moreover, Kelkheim's mayor, uh, his name was Wilhelm Graf, harbored deep anti-Semitic feelings. He immediately segregated the Jewish laborers from other laborers, and when they arrived, he ordered uh, beatings of these uh, uh, arriving uh, Jewish men. The forced labor conditions in this town were so terrible, and this is really before the war, yeah, um, that earlier one Jewish man committed suicide. In his time uh, in Kalkheim, uh, he was there performing forced labor for eight months, uh, frustrated Hans, um, according to Gestapo records, uh, rebelled by smashing windows in this small town. After his uh, uh, stay in this camp, in November 1940, Hans returned to Frankfurt. The labor office now sent him to a local building supply uh, business. He still lived with his, with his parents. I mean, he was 17 years old, and despite that he didn't get along with his stepmother. Since Hans' father, Sigmund, had lost his business, the family depended on public welfare. After the city of Frankfurt uh, stopped paying welfare uh, payments to Jews, the family was entirely dependent on the Jewish community. Because of all of these circumstances, which I just described, uh, I think this made Hans Oppenheimer deciding to do something against the Nazis and the ongoing persecution. So he began to break the curfew for Jews every night And as I uh, said in the beginning, when the Allied bombers closed in and the sirens started to warn the city population, he set on off wrong fire alarms in order to divert the fire trucks from the actual bombing sites. In some cases, 
He waited till the fire trucks arrived. When they realized there was nothing, and they went, he pulled the alarm again. Unfortunately, Hans only used three locations which were very close to his home because he feared that uh, kind of uh, ongoing pat uh, uh, patrolling uh, officers would kind of uh, detect him or uh, catch him. So none of these places had been far from his home. Hence, a firefighter set up a trap and on December 10th, 1940, around 10 p.m., a, a sergeant of the fire protection police caught him right in front of the fire alarm box in the moment when Hans, Hans wanted to shatter the glass and pull the handle. After the Gestapo arrested Hans, they interrogated him. And we have to assume that this was also physical. Uh, but he still only confessed to nine attempts of wrong fire alarms. He had to wait uh, in pre-trial detention for four months. And in April 1941, the main prosecutor in Frankfurt am Main indicted him for damaging public property in four cases. And he charged him with several felonies according to the criminal code as well as with, uh, for offenses under the war decree against public vermins, Volksschädlinge. The written indictment, uh, indictment emphasized right at the beginning that Hans Oppenheimer was a Jew, a full Jew. And it pointed out that by Gestapo assessment, Hans was unstable, lazy, and a dishonest human being. And he was eager to destroy things. So this was the Gestapo assessment. The Frankfurt prosecutor at the trial suspected that Hans was actually responsible for far more fire alarms than the nine he admitted. In his area, during the last weeks and months before he was caught, 44 wrong fire alarms were pulled, 44. And the series, this, the series of wrong fire alarms ended with his arrest. You can judge, right? Uh, the indictment mentioned that the German People's Court was not able to prove military treason, which would have resulted in a death penalty. Therefore, the main prosecutor ended up charging Hans with far lesser crimes, like felonies. But Frankfurt's prosecutor informed the Reich Ministry in Berlin for justice about the case. And in the letter, he proposed a sentence of six years in penitentiary and argued that the punishment should be especially harsh for, Jew, for a Jew who had acted as an enemy during the war of the German people. In addition, he demanded to try Hans as an adult although he was only 17 years old when he set off the fire alarms. So on May 2nd, 1941, the police brought Hans to the Frankfurt Special Court where the trial was held. These special courts had been introduced in 1933 in many cities in Germany to uh, punish political uh, enemies like communists and social democrats. What we didn't know is that many of these special uh, uh, courts, uh, which are what I found in the archives, actually tried Jews for public protest. Yeah? So there are many cases in these special courts uh, against uh, Jewish men and women who spoke up against the persecution. The court in Frankfurt, the special court, charged Hans with nine uh, cases of malicious acts perpetrated during the months of November and December 1940. During the trial, there was no defense lawyer present. Hans, who was now uh, 18 years old, had to defend himself. In the end, the special court punished Hans with three years in prison for being a public vermin, sabotaging the war effort. 
Fortunately for Hans, the judge neither did uh, followed the prosecution's request to put Hans in a penitentiary, which is an especially harsh prison in Germany, nor did he apply uh, adult law. The judge also took into account that Hans did not have a criminal record. However, the judge emphasized in his verdict that a Jew, that as a Jew, Hans should have paid special attention to the law since he was only tolerated as a guest in Germany, although he was born in Frankfurt. Following the verdict, Hans was transferred in June 1941 to a prison in a small town called Dies an der Lahn, approximately 50 miles away from Frankfurt. From the first day on, the prison warden held Hans in solitary confinement. To prevent any contact from other inmates, he did not give, uh, uh, get permission to work outside, so he had to stay in his cell for months, um, and he had to fold to work to fold bags and envelopes day in, day out. The isolation and the conditions in prison took a heavy toll on Hans. His only lifeline was writing letters to his family, to his parents, and he begged his parents to visit him. He needed medication because he developed uh, certain illnesses, skin rashes, and painful teeth cav cavities because there was no medical attention to him in the prison. Hans did not know that some of his messages ended up being shelved in the prison file, censored by the warden for being too outspoken about the prison conditions uh, in his letters to his parents. His, quick, uh, his health quickly deteriorated, uh, exhaust, he was exhausted physically and mentally, but still, despite all these struggles, he did not back down. Several times uh, during his prison stay, he petitioned the prison warden, uh, protesting against the maltreatment uh, uh, by the guards in the prison. And he told one of his supervisors, quote, you need to complain even if you are a Jew. And uh, this supervisor later wrote a report about him and called him uh, his behavior uh, in prison impudent and defiant. When his parents asked him in a letter to change his behavior so that he can get out of uh, uh, insulation, Hans responded that this was not his fault alone. In one of his confiscated letters, Hans wrote at the end that thinking about his life would make him go crazy. I quote, you know best, as he told his parents in this letter, that I never visited a cinema, a theater, or a cabaret. End of quote. In October 1941, he strangled himself, but was saved by the guard. Two months later, because of these conditions in prison, he attempted to take his life again. He tried to jump over a railing in the fourth floor of the prison, was kind of held back by the guard again. But his depression and uh, his pain, uh, this physical pain, uh, just kind of increased during the next year. The prison guards and the warden, they never uh, paid attention to his problems, nor did they inform his parents about his problems. They didn't even know that he uh, committed suicide or tried to commit suicide twice. In a letter uh, uh, from August 1942, which the prison staff again withheld from Hans, the parents wrote that at the end of September, they expected their evacuation to the ghetto Theresienstadt. The letter was handwritten with a fountain pen. On the left margin of the letter, the father added with a pencil, quote, just received the request to be prepared for the September 2nd. Hence, far they well, end of quote. The parents were deported uh, to the ghetto, ghetto Theresienstadt on September 1st, 1942, as many elderly Jews during these weeks and months. And in Theresienstadt, his father died after only two months, and his stepmother was later deported to Auschwitz. In mid-September, the newly appointed Reich Minister of Justice, Otto Tirak, 
agreed with the head of the SS, Heinrich Lim Himmler, to hand over all so-called asocial elements from prison to concentration camps, including all Jews. And they were to kind of put in a program extermination through work. Normally, this would have meant to transfer Jews in prison like Hans into a concentration camp in Germany. But the SS Himmler gave the order to clear all uh, concentration camps in the Reich and to move them all to Auschwitz. Hence, the Frankfurt general prosecutor requested that all Jewish inmates from the small prison in Dies would have to be transferred uh, to Frankfurt and then to Auschwitz. While Hans was waiting in Frankfurt in prison for his transport, he rebelled again. During an Allied air raid, he didn't brown out his window. Uh, for kind of showing the Allied bombers light, so to speak, uh, he was punished again with isolation and uh, withdrawal of food. He then was transported to Auschwitz, and there, he, because of the weakened state, uh, you can imagine he did not survive for long. He, his death was recorded on January 30th, 1943, mere, uh, a few days after he had turned 20 years old. So what does the story of Hans uh, Oppenheimer reveal about the responses of Jews toward Nazi persecution? During the Third Reich, many SS and Gestapo reports complained endlessly about the so-called impudent Jews. For example, in March 1935, the Gestapo in Aachen reported that, quote, the number of Jews who had sent letters and protested in person has become quite numerous and in their tone often impudent, end of quote. During the next months and years, you find endless kind of similar uh, quotes in these reports. And still during the war, in April 1940, the headquarter of the SS in Berlin emphasized that it had received information from all corners of the Reich about the impudent attitude of Jews. Historians like myself, we always knew these quotes, but we always thought the SS had put them in these reports to justify radical, new radical measures. But after my research, uh, I think this was not a trope. This was actually based on reality. So it was not just Nazi rhetoric. When in July 1935 in Berlin, the Gestapo emphasized that Jews were born with disrespect for state authority. Because at the same month or during the same months, there were week-long anti-Jewish protests in Berlin demonstrations, and the police arrested more than 100 Jews for protests against the state uh, and uh, the Nazi party. Years later, during the war, the Gestapo arrested dozens of Jews for similar protests in Berlin, in Vienna, um, and in Prague, there was a report circulating in the Reich Protector Office that the impudent behavior of Jews multiplied after the invasion of the Soviet Union. Despite the fact that after a year of mass deportations in 1942, there were only 55,000 Jews left in Germany, at the same time, over 1,200 Jews were in prison for offenses against the Reich and the Nazi party. Hence, these Complaints about impudent Jews point to a forgotten reality of widespread acts of resistance of Jews. During the last decade, my research revealed hundreds and hundreds of cases how, uh, where Jews, men and women, did resist Nazi persecution in various ways. My uh, research strongly challenges the idea that uh, Jews in general, but particularly German Jews, did not resist the terrors of the Third Reich. And I think the problem is that uh, the previous notion of the Jews were more passive, uh, based on only two reasons. 
One was a conceptual uh, uh, problem, a narrow conceptual approach, and the other one was a limited source base. So when historians discussed res resistance uh, during ho the Holocaust, they always talked about organized resistance, armed resistance, like the partisans, uprisings. Uh, and they ma mainly focused on Eastern Europe, but not in Germany. Hence, therefore, systematic uh, kind of in analysis of individual acts of resistance is missing in almost all Holocaust accounts. Even those who are kind of uh, supporting the integration of Jewish voices, like the very widely acclaimed works of Saul Friedlander, don't go into ind individual Jewish resistance. So what I try to do in my work is to broaden this understanding what we understand uh, under uh, Jewish resistance. And this is not original, that's not my invention. Uh, I base my, my work on uh, early uh, Israeli historian uh, Meir Dworjewski, who had already talked about similar things in the 1950s, uh, an Australian historian, Kweed, uh, Konrad Kweed, and the East German survivor, Helmut Eschwege in the 1970s, they all talked about we need to broaden our understanding, our concept of what resistance actually meant. So what I did in my work is I used a very well-known um, definition by Yehuda Bauer, a prominent Israeli historian of the Holocaust, and added just one word, individual, so that the definition of Jewish resistance reads, Res Jewish resistance is any individual or group action in opposition to known laws, actions, or intentions of the Nazis and, the help, and their helpers. So with this broader approach, for example, disobeying laws, public protests, are kind of uh, falling under the broader rubric of resistance, which I find especially justified because in contrast to other groups of the German Jewish population, Jews were uh, exposed to racial persecution and special legislation. The second reason uh, for the absence of individual resistance in most narratives is that most historians used limited sources for their assessment of the attitudes of Jews. And these were mainly Nazi reports on the one hand, and the Nazis didn't want to emphasize uh, individual Jewish resistance. And then uh, diaries or letters of uh, uh, Jews where they also didn't want to speak uh, about this kind of resistance because uh, there was surveillance. So what I did in my research is I went to almost 10 different German cities into the archives uh, looking into police records, uh, court records, and not just the special courts which I mentioned, but also regular courts. And uh, I went to uh, the Yad Vashem archive, the Holocaust Museum, and I uh, discovered, as I said, hundreds and hundreds of cases. And then on, in addition to this, I also examined 170 survivor testimonies from the USC uh, Shoah Foundation Visual History Archive. So in the rest of the time, I want to give you a brief overview over the uh, kind of the range of different responses uh, uh, of different resistant acts uh, of uh, German Jews um, throughout the time from 33 to 1945. What I did in my research is I identified five different types. And I said in the beginning, my book has five chapters. So every chapter stands for one type of resistance. And I uh, kind of have these categories. One is contesting Nazi propaganda. The second one is oral protest. The third one is written protest. The uh, fourth one is defying uh, Nazi legislation. And the last one is physical self-defense. So let me briefly share some examples uh, of these different categories. Contesting Nazi propaganda. As police records uh, show, Jews actively fought Nazi propaganda and anti-Jewish propaganda right from the start in 1933. Um, throughout the 1930s, Jews were arrested in Munich and in Hamburg for besmearing displays of anti-Semitic newspapers, for destroying Nazi flags, posters, and Nazi symbols. 
1936, the Jewish merchant, merchant David Bornstein tried to destroy a Nazi swastika sign on a local bus in Hamburg. The special court punished him with five weeks in jail. But this was not only five weeks in jail. Two years later, uh, there was a raid against so-called asocials. And uh, Heydrich included so-called asocial Jews. That means, uh, or meant, uh, Jews with minor criminal offenses in their records. And we thought always these were kind of traffic violations or so, but my research shows that Jews who protested and were tried and when were punished with jail time were actually then brought into concentration camps because they had a criminal record. He uh, survived the crim uh, concentration camps and just to share this with you, he made it out of Germany and uh, settled in Palestine. But even during the war, Jews are r arrested for ripping down uh, anti-Jewish posters, destroying Nazi flags. So this goes on for the whole time. All protest. Again, from the very beginning, Jews started to protest in public uh, against, uh, again, uh, against the persecution. Jews were put on trial in Frankfurt again for publicly criticizing the beatings and murder by stormtroopers during the first weeks of the Nazi kind of uh, state as well as the torture of Jews in early concentration camps. Throughout the years, Jewish men and women spoke up in public um, specific laws and some also uh, specific events led to spikes in uh, public protest of Jews. For example, and this is what we commemorate today, during Kristallnacht, more Jewish men and women were actually speaking up and were being arrested for critique. For example, Henriette Schaefer, she lived in Frankfurt again. Uh, the day after the program, she entered a shop and approached the uh, store owner, quote, saying, what are you saying about the fact that everything is destroyed and the synagogues are art arsoned, end of quote. After the owner responded with the official na Nazi narrative, that the people are outraged about the murder of the uh, German diplomat in Paris by a Jew, Henriette Schaefer replied, quote, this is not the people, this is but the government. The government are all blackguards, scams, criminals. Hitler is the biggest bandit. If I could, I would poison them all, end of quote. She received six months in prison for this public comment under the law against treacherous attacks uh, on the state and the party. Let me come to the third part, written protest. Again, Jews intervened uh, also in writing against the persecution, against the discrimination in Nazi Germany. We can find, for example, petitions uh, authored by Jews in large numbers in any given German archive. And Jews did not just ask to be exempted from certain measures, but they always reclaimed their identity as German citizens, as taxpayers, and also as contributors to the homeland. During the summer of 1935, as I already mentioned, in Berlin there were these uh, uh, demonstrations where Jewish stores were defaced with humiliating slogans against Jews, and also some stormtroopers attacked physically Jews and foreigners. While some Jewish store owners reacted by writing uh, critical petitions to the Berlin police president, um, some in, uh, kind of businesses found in their mailboxes an anonymous leaflet with the message, I quote, Germany is a cultural disgrace today. I'm a German Jew and loyal to the emperor. In fact, the Germans should expel the foreigner Hitler. Down with Hitler, exclamation mark, end of, uh, end of quote. Later in the war, we find more petitions with critique uh, against the persecution, for example, especially in Vienna. There are uh, dozens and dozens of uh, pe these petitions because of the expulsion from their homes. 
Uh, but there were also, again, uh, attempts anonymously to protest against the persecution. And I want to share one story, which is also in the book. Um, in the fall of 1941, a former real estate uh, broker, uh, the 60-year-old Benno Neuburger, was outraged about the branding of the Jews with the Yellow Star, which was introduced in September 1941. Over the next months, he applied Hitler post stamps. They were small five cent kind of uh, green post stamps with his portrait onto postcards. And then he wrote abusive comments over them. Comments like, quote, the eternal mass murderer Hitler, disgusting, exclamation mark. And one of them, and these were dozens of postcards, which he sent out, one of them bore a very four-sided comment, and I quote, Hitler, murderer of five million. The Gestapo caught him because he made a mistake. He used uh, one postcard from his uh, uh, old real estate firm, which didn't exist anymore. Um, they tortured him. And uh, then he was put on trial in Berlin in the uh, People's Court. And even there, in the Berlin People's Court, he stood for his conviction and said in public, on trial, that he hated Hitler, especially for his pronouncement to exterminate all Jews, which he had in a, uh, kind of uh, issued in a public speech in January 1939. Trial lasted only two hours, and he was uh, punished with the death penalty and uh, decapitated in September 1942. We talked already about defying Nazi laws, uh, because this is what practically um, Hans uh, Oppenheimer did. Uh, there are many other uh, kind of local restrictions, Nazi laws, which were defied by Jews. Um, and since I'm running out of time, I will kind of uh, don't go into this. Just one thing is we all know that Jews had to uh, adopt uh, the discriminatory middle names Sarah and Israel. Um, again, here we find uh, dozens of dozens uh, of people in all local archives I have seen who resisted to adopt these middle names because the German law asked that you need to apply for a name change. So Jews had actually to pay three Reichsmark, fill out a form to adopt Sarah and Israel. And many just didn't do it. Some people got away for several uh, years. For example, in Leipzig, the 73-year-old Ida Schneider, she never applied for the identification card nor for the name change and she was only detected in 1941. And then for these crimes, not filling out the application form, she received seven months in prison. The last part, physical self-defense. And this was the most astonishing for me when I did this research. Um, from the Shaw Foundation visual uh, history archive testimonies, from the survivor testimonies, we learn that Jewish men got into brawls with stormtroopers um, on the street, yeah, sometimes in buildings. Sometimes they got into brawls with Nazi neighbors who were kind of discriminated, uh, discriminating against Jews. And then even during the Kristallnacht, we find instances of uh, where Jews try to defend themselves against physical attacks. For example, in Peine, in Lower Saxony, when a group of SS men invaded the home of the Marburger family and they started to beat up the uh, father of the family, uh, a 17 year old boy, the, the son, tried to fight the SS off, but he was overwhelmed and then he was shot by the SS. In a kind of case with a better outcome, which I shared also with the uh, teacher uh, training yesterday, Daisy Gronowski was a 16-year-old uh, girl from Berlin who had uh, kind of uh, was member of the Hashomer uh, uh, Zionist youth group. 
she lived in a uh, Hachshara camp uh, with kind of a training for the immigration to Palestine. Um, they got agricultural training there, the, uh, the teenagers. And this camp was raided as many of these camps during Kristallnacht and also like homes, the interior was smashed and the people were beaten up. And when she, they, the stormtroopers tried to beat also up the girls, not just the uh, Jewish teen, uh, men, uh, male teenagers, she used a jiu-jitsu trick and stabbed one of the attackers and escaped. And she escaped, was caught later, escaped again and made it out into, uh, uh, finally to England where, uh, and then f ended up in Los Angeles in uh, the U uh, United States. So these were just kind of a rough, very brief overview of the variety of uh, individual acts of resistance which I found. And uh, every chapter in my book is one story, but I share a lot of other stories too, so to show that the individual story, the main story is just the, uh, the tip of the iceberg, uh, so to speak. So let me come to my conclusion. Three weeks after Nazi Germany invaded Poland, the 30-year-old Edith Britz wrote a letter which the Gestapo intercepted. She had already been uh, kind of uh, denunciated because she had so-called political conversations with non-Jewish Germans, but she uh, was not put on trial because some people vouched for her. But in this letter, this Jewish woman from Berlin described uh, to her sister that one morning at 6 a.m., two police officers knocked at her door, on her door. Edith Britz wrote, quote, I'm so upset that I could attack anybody who wants to come into my pet. I will go crazy if there will be more. They stole my sleep. They stole everything from me, end of quote. This citation, I think, reveals a level of anxiety, anger, and repulsion that many Jews have felt after experiencing years of persecution. And I think it's not too far-fetched to assume that such emotions might have motivated many of the individual actions of Jewish men and women, including those of Hans Oppenheimer. So when we define resistance as any individual or group actions, this opens up new perspectives. However, although I found hundreds and hundreds of cases, uh, there is much more to discover because I only visited several archives, right? There are many more archives still to kind of to visit. And then other incidents never left traces in the archives because people were not denunciated people got away. Uh, so there is a, lo a large number of cases which uh, we don't know about. So what I think is that to appreciate these courageous effort of so many uh, German Jews, we need to kind of amend our standard Holocaust narrative. These acts like from Hans Oppenheimer, they need to be incorporated in our narrative, how we tell the story of the Holocaust. And it's not only too important to preserve their memory, but it's also to understand that they reacted very differently to different policies. And every individual reacted in different ways, used different tools, and developed also different strategies over time because the persecution also changed. And uh, so I think when we incorporate these uh, instances, um, we can tell a richer story of Jewish responses during the, the Holocaust. And one assessment I have to make is that I didn't see differences between men and women regarding resistance. There are no differences between uh, age groups, yeah? young and old resistant. There are no differences of social status, education, um, so we see a broad spectrum of the Jewish population act in this way. There are certain things, for example, with the name change, more elderly Jews didn't apply. Uh, the physical self-defense, these are more younger Jews. But in general, there are no big differences um, regarding the Jewish resistance. 
So understanding Jewish men and women as historical actors renders all their claims of their passivity obsolete, once and for all. And when so many people resisted Nazi measures, I think this finally restores agency uh, to the uh, German Jews and many more when we apply the same lens to other territories occupied by the Nazis. Thank you. Professor Gruner, we do have time for questions. I don't. I will repeat them for some people, but I don't know if this gets passed around either. But um, let's take a look. Probably leave it. Um, so I'll kind of I'll field the Q and A, and um, we'll see how far we go. But please, questions. Yes, Paul. So, so given the times uh, in, in the thirties and the fact that there was nobody other than the resistance people opposing the Nazis, why did the Nazis go through the process of arresting, prosecuting, taking to court, and then jailing these people? Uh, you know, it's not unlike you know, diverting resources from the war, but, but were, were they wanting to document this stuff in order to further their cause? Or, or were they just so anal retentive that, that they wanted to go through the motions of let me repeat the question if you didn't hear in the back. Why did the Nazis, given their sort of preponderance of power, go through the process of arresting, putting people on trial, going through the sort of formalities of this whole uh, sort of legalistic uh, procedure that they didn't need to, need to do? Yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, but I think uh, it comes from uh, that we have somehow a misconception uh, because we, we are looking backwards. And we are, we are kind of very influenced by what happens during the war. And so we, uh, the Nazi state is somehow characterized by the state at the end. But uh, there was a development. And uh, we, uh, what I think is important, even during the war, the Nazis had an understanding that they are a legal system. Yeah, and even though the SS had large powers, they could not just put everybody in the concentration camp. So there were certain rules they had to follow. So they had this kind of legalistic uh, framework, which they needed to uh, uh, kind of pay attention to. So it was really more the exception of the rule that Jews would, who resisted would put immediately into a concentration camp. There's one exception. Um, in Vienna, the Gestapo didn't care so much. They, uh, in, especially in 1941 and 1942, when the deportations happened, when people protested there, they went immediately into the concentration camps, but not in Germany, not in Berlin, not in Frankfurt, not in Hamburg, not in Munich. So there was kind of legalistic uh, framework which they followed. And um, when there was a law broken, it should be punished by law. So the Nazis still obeyed to these, uh, to these rules. Yeah, so it's strange as it sounds, but there are many things I discovered throughout this research that, me included, I had misconceptions. I always thought there is this steady Nazification of all institutions, and at the end there were only Nazis. But what I see here is that in the judiciary, judges behaved very differently. The prosecutors were more anti-Semitic, but the judges often really followed the law. And if there was, uh, for example, in one case, I, I, I found several cases where Jews actually were acquitted, although they protested in public, because the witness was not reliable. Yeah, in one case, there is, uh, they were den uh, denunciated by a 14-year-old uh, non-Jewish boy who then on trial said that he thought he get a kind of a, a, a award for uh, denunciating Jews. And then they acquitted, they said, this is a mistrial. Yeah? So there were, there were also these circumstances. But then you have the others, as what I uh, think in the case of uh, Hans Oppenheimer uh, showed really uh, kind of the complexity that on the one hand, they asked for especially hard punishment. But then if they could not apply the law, they had to reduce the things, right? The punishment should have been treason, but they could not prove it. And so in the end, he got away with three years, which didn't help him much in the end. 
but you see how this kind of that they still uh, how this system still worked. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I find it interesting that you can go back to Germany in this day and time and still find records to access with all the destruction that took place, and they kept such good records. And that's attributed to what we what we learned about the Nazi regime. But even before the 40s, they took those uh, records to heart. Yeah, so uh, let me just repeat that. Did you hear in the back? Um, so this was just a comment on the uh, availability of these records and the ability, the willingness of Germans in the 1930s and 40s to keep meticulous records. And the fact that they still exist um, is worth <laughs> reflecting on it. But I want to con comment on the comment. Uh, uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, I haven't seen many archives, uh, but I have seen those I've uh, visited. And in those archives, there are records, but there are also records missing. So, for example, in Berlin, the special court records, uh, we know that there were more than 10,000 cases, but only 2,000 cases survived. So, I had to work with 2,000 out of 10,000 cases where I found my cases uh, in Berlin. And the same is true. For example, um, the first case I found was in this police logbook from the Berlin uh, police precincts. So what the ordinary kind of policeman is writing down. In no other city in Germany, these logbooks survived. So there are a lot of records missing. Uh, it's also especially true for the Gestapo records. Only in Würzburg and in Düsseldorf, uh, Gestapo records survived. We have no Gestapo records from Berlin. Yeah, we have no Gestapo records in Munich. So for many of the cities, we don't have records. So it seems like a lot, but it's, uh, you have to kind of think this is the kind of 14 years of research in trying to find in pieces, bits and pieces and to put them together. Yeah? So there's a lot missing still. Yes, sir. And then um, I'm kind of curious because Hitler tried to encourage voluntary immigration of German Jews from Germany. What was the number of Jews before it started? What was the number left in, in the population you are looking for cases? Probably were most gone or? Yeah, that's fine. If, I think you could hear, can you hear in the back? So, so, all right, well, I think the answer will probably uh, <laughs> get, get, make clear with the question. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, so over time, the, the number of Jews changed because of immigration. So it starts with, we say, uh, half a million uh, Jew, German Jews, but counted by religion. In reality, uh, also Protestant uh, uh, and Catholics uh, who, had, uh, who were of Jewish origin were persecuted as Jews. As Jews. So the number goes down. And uh, in... I think before the war starts, it's down to, um, I think, 200,000 or so. And then uh, with the mass deportation, I think it's 150,000. And then with the mass deportations in 1943, it's down to 50,000. Yeah? And then uh, much less. So that's the numbers. So uh, it is, there is probably a larger number also of protests available uh, if we could find the sources in the earlier times. But interestingly, when I looked at the, uh, the archives over time, which I did, uh, it doesn't really change much the numbers. Yeah? So maybe this has also to do what I uh, try to do in my conclusion to say, you need also to accumulate a certain anger to actually uh, break the rules, right? And they, I mean, German Jews were Germans also. So the Germans are always kind of following rules and are, yeah, so there are certain things. Well, I would like to answer in one more way. Some German Jews were more offended by being told that they're not German than by being told that they're Jewish. Mm -hmm. I mean, the German Jews can successfully thrive in Germany. Why say they're not Germans? And this is the comment that you didn't hear was more, some people were more offended by being told that they were somehow not German. The, the, the sort of indignity of telling people who Jewish Germans that they weren't German. It's been from, spoken very well. Marsha. Uh, I've never heard anything about forced name changing. You talked about that. Could you? Tell us something about forcing name change. The forced, they, uh, please elaborate on the forced name change. So, so what I call the forced name change is the adoption of Sarah and Israel as middle names. 
And you know that in the passports, German Jews had to put Sarah as uh, the woman, Sarah, and the men had to put Israel to identify them as Jews, because this, these were supposedly Jewish names. And you could only avoid this if you had a Jewish name, like Israel, then you were not, you didn't need to adopt another Israel. Um, but uh, what I meant with forced name change, there was a decree ordering that all Jews had to do this. Yeah. Yes. You uh, mentioned about the woman resistor to uh, the England and the United States. By chance, was she still alive for you to interview her? Or were there other survivors who were resistors that you were able to interview? And if so, what struck you by the kind of person they were, or maybe you know, what they really did? Yeah, that's a good question. So first of all, uh, so uh, uh, she's, she passed away, uh, I think, 10 years ago or so. Um, so I couldn't f interview her anymore. Uh, but the story is based on an interview in the Shoah Foundation. So I, we have a large interview with her. That's where I got my, uh, the, the story from. And then I tried to corroborate the story with uh, archival research and so on. Um, the, I, had, I have a friend who is 98 years old who comes into my class. He's not from Germany, but from Poland. And he is uh, one of these uh, people who resisted all the time, like Hans. Yeah? I mean, from the beginning to the end, always rebellious. And he always, and we talked about this earlier, he always claims this was luck, what kind of, but it, uh, what I think is he was proactive he always kind of created situations where he was able to resist. He uh, made uh, sure that he escapes from ghetto, from the camp. Uh, he then also was not thinking only in himself, but also he saved seven other, other Jews. So it, um, what I didn't say much about here, but I, we talked in the teacher training about this, when I make the, kind of put the focus on individual Jews, uh, this doesn't mean that they were totally isolated or alone. They had always kind of friends, family, and this uh, has a lot to do also with uh, if they were encouraged to do things or not. Sometimes the parents also would discourage, right? Uh, so um, in this way, and there are, in a way, I can't really see personal traits. It's much more about situations and uh, if people are proactive, I would say. We have about six more minutes. I, bear, I have a question, but I'd rather hear from you. Anybody? Yes, Henry. So I'm curious, I think in the, if I remember correctly, in the story of um, Hans Oppenheimer, he said he was, I think he was initially tried by like a municipal kind of court. Uh, and then there are other stories where you talk about like the special courts or the people's courts. So I'm curious, like, is it primarily like, in a lot of like these cases of like protests, like, or oral resistance, or like written resistance, or other forms of protest. Is it primarily the municipal courts that deal with like the kind of city municipal courts, which may or may not be not supplied to various degrees? Or is it mostly the special courts or people's courts, which I'm assuming are more not supplied, are like kind of run by the Nazis? Are they the ones which, uh, or which kind of like even, like, in, like which courts like handled these kinds of cases? Yeah, dependent on the crime. Yeah, so public protest, written protest, usually was tried by special courts, but breaking the curfew, uh, damaging property, uh, these were try, they were tried by regular courts. Yeah, so that's the difference. And interesting is that I, I started with special courts because I had the, the kind of uh, wanted to find this public protest. And then I realized that also regular courts tried Jews for all these other things, sometimes because they couldn't prove the political offense. And then they tried, like in Hunt's case, they uh, kind of went back to the civil code. Uh, 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 no, is it civil code? The, the criminal code uh, to, uh, to punish uh, somebody. I have a question. So um, I'm curious, do you think the fact that some people petition even well into 1940, 41, indicates a naivete or a frustration or a sense, maybe as mentioned before, that their Germanness was, they felt entitled to this sort of recourse. 
I'm kind of curious what you think maybe the expectation was when somebody is writing to a government that's had been persecuting them for a number of years. Yeah, so I think, first of all, there was a, uh, a tradition and also a right to petition uh, in the German uh, constitution. So you can petition a government. Um, and many uh, Jews did this uh, from the beginning till the end. Um, we always kind of thought they have written this in vain. This is not, the Nazis didn't care at all. But uh, I had uh, kind of co-edited a volume where we, uh, with a uh, colleague, Thomas Pegelo Kaplan, where we looked into what actually happened with these uh, petitions. And we uh, conveyed specialists on Germany, uh, Austria, the protectorate, uh, France, Hungary, and um, Romania. And we found out that, first of all, what I mentioned is claiming your identity, reclaiming practically, is important as an act of protest, uh, and also towards the government. But then uh, we should not underestimate that these um, petitions were actually uh, received by institutions. They were read. Then they decided what to do. And interestingly, they involved other institutions, which speaks against the idea that this was just thrown into the basket, in the wastebasket. So they involved other institutions, and in some cases, this actually meant that people gained time. Yeah? So they could, uh, for example, get out. Yeah? They could avoid deportation uh, if the act was still in process. Uh, and then, interestingly, what I totally didn't ex or never expected, some of them were actually successful. So one of our colleagues in this volume talks about uh, Hungary. And uh, in Hungary, when in 1944, uh, uh, the kind of Jews had to move in Jews' houses, kind of creating a ghetto in Budapest, um, many Jews petitioned to stay in their houses, to not lose their network, their environment, their, their resources. Um, and interestingly, the non-Jews also petitioned because they also didn't want to move. And what happens in the end, in uh, not quite a few cases, they created mixed houses, which is meant that the Jew state and the Aryan state, so the whole purpose of creating a ghetto was kind of vanishing. So it is not that they just kind of did this. There was also uh, a lot more be a kind of uh, behind this. And, uh, and I think we, we have to reconsider a lot of the, of the things which we just kind of brushed away and as not important. Yeah. Well, I want to thank our speaker, Professor Wolf.